Um, let me just start with just a brief clarification. Oh, we might have a sir. Uh, I'd like to start, is this okay? I'll start with a, a brief clarification. Uh, the article was written by myself. It was not an organizational article. I'm very, I'm very proud to be associated with CCDS, and we are having a convention in July, at which time I hope a resolution on left unity will pass, but I just wanted to make it clear that to this point at least, uh, I'm just kind of speaking for myself, but I think within the spirit of what uh, CCPS would like to represent. Uh, we don't need to belabor the crisis that we're in right now. It's a structural crisis of world capitalism. It's a crisis that is based largely upon the old dictum that the capitalist relations of production simply no longer contain the productive forces that are building throughout global society. And that crisis reflects interrelated elements. An economic crisis, an environmental crisis, a crisis of war and empire. And those crises, interrelated and interlocking, are foundations for a multitude of attacks on the working class, on its allies, as well as serious, fomenting serious violations of constitutional rights, with the gap between wealth and poverty widening to unprecedented levels. Among young people, and it's good to see young people here tonight, among young people, the worsening prospects for work, for growth, for culture, uh, represent, and the deepest assault, of course, is on African-American youth and other young oppressed nationalities, and that constitutes a crisis of enormous magnitude. And of course, there's intensified class war at the heart of things, tearing at the fabric of social payments built up over 75 years and a historic assault upon the trade union movement in the United States. Given all that, it's no wonder then that the most recent Pew poll, among the most assaulted generation, the 18 to 29 group, 49% have a positive view of socialism, however defined, however understood. 43% have a negative view. That's an exact reversal of May 2010, where the poll showed 49% negative and 43% positive, so there's a big flip there. There's been a recent upsurge in struggles, which are building throughout the world, especially among the young, uh, and among heavily in, uh, exploited fast food, box store workers, agriculture workers, teachers, healthcare workers, and so on led by oppressed uh, nationalities of women, demonstrating the powerful reinforcing intersections of class, race, and gender. In the midst of these developments, socialist organizations remain weak, yet, more, yet they're more needed than ever. And I think that's what kind of goaded me into writing this piece. As I said in the article, quote, at every major juncture in the history of the country, Radical individuals and organizations in advance of the mainstream have played essential roles in influencing, guiding, and consolidating broad currents for social change. It's not to suggest that only socialist organizations have led mass movements, but certainly organizations and movements in advance of the mainstream have been fundamental and have been critical in moving forward these great struggles which have brought significant reason, positive results. The reasons for the weakness of the left socialist formations. It, reasons are varied, and we don't have time to go into them in detail, but certainly they're rooted in history. And they're rooted in the significant and painful failures of the 20th century. They're rooted in the subjective weaknesses of the left, and they're rooted also in the hegemony of the system and its dominating means of communication. But that basic weakness that derives from these other factors that small size and the inadequate resources of individual organizations are now choking off any chance for an effective influential voice in this huge complex country. 20th century ideological divisions are fading into irrelevance. Some folks would like to continue the quarrels of 40, 50, 60 years ago. But I would argue that the prospects are good given the evolution, the evolving time and the evolution of thinking, that prospects are good for unity built upon joint struggles, 
to confront the austerity and exploring together that central need for systemic change, a vision of a socialist future. A less socialist unity is a growing trend worldwide, and we in the United States ought to be part of it. Thus, there are two interrelated challenges, one would argue. There's a convergence all committed to struggle for defense and, and ex, for the defense and expansion of democracy. To engage with mass movements with modesty, open debate and discussion of ways out of the present crisis. Showing the inseparable connection between issues and inseparably studying, debating, and charting the road to a socialist society abetted by study of the varying paths taken around the world for social transformation. Four organizations were already uh, meeting under the, under the leadership of the Left Labor Project. And it's under those auspices that they began to explore areas of cooperation and ways to cooperate in defending working people and advancing a socialist vision. There are already within these groups divergent opinions and ideas, but people working together but not necessarily sharing a total agreement on all questions. But that, what that grouping of four organizations helped by others represents is a starting point. As I said in the paper, quote, for other left than socialist groups and individuals to join as equal participants in building an imaginative, revitalized socialist present. This must be an absolutely inclusive project, embracing all who wish to participate on the common ground of struggling for the expansion of democracy and building a program of socialist education. Common ground forged through, dis through discussion and cooperation in fighting the assault on working people and in working to achieve an effective socialist project. Now, there's no magic formula. There are no guarantees that a unified movement would fully reflect the demographics that are changing in the country, or within, in itself would represent a significant uh, change in the dynamics of political organization. A number of people have pointed out that zero plus zero equals zero, that you have weak organizations, you bring them together, and you're going to have a single weak organization. Well, I would argue that hard work at all levels with, in building an alliance, a work that will require new energy, new imagination, and new political will can make a change. There can't be a conversion of small groups into a small alliance. Large numbers of people, many who have left progressive left and socialist movements in the past, could be inspired by the, the simple fact of groups that have heretofore had strong ideological differences now beginning to come together. Large numbers of young people can respond to dynamic, imaginative educational programs that take advantage of the internet and take advantage of the goodwill and open-mindedness that should be characteristic of any kind of movement that we build. That alliance should address the need for pooled educational resources, publications, schools, the internet, the use of the internet, think tanks, having the financial resources, pooling resources and developing financial resources that can pay to, to, to have organizers go into the heartland, not, not conceding the red states that historically have been among the most radical states in the country. The anti-racist, anti-sexist traditions of the left could be a basis for addressing those demographic weaknesses on the socialist left and beginning to build a significantly interracial, multicultural movement of young people and young workers in particular. As I indicated in the article, my own personal preference is for a single new organization. But that won't happen in the near term. It probably won't even happen in the medium term. <laughs> if it ever happens, it will be established on the, by the experience of working together and nurturing, nurturing a culture of goodwill and mutual respect. An alliance must have meaning. An alliance should be built from the bottom up to encourage collaboration at the top. The struggle against austerity 
the struggle for jobs, for environmental survival, for improvement in the concrete condi uh, conditions of the people represent the tangible issues around which to unite. Socialist education should be inseparably related to mass democratic action. Electoral issues should be open for debate and continuing exploration with a variety of, pro of approaches possible within an overriding alliance. Now, there's been criticism, and one of the criticisms since the article was written, which I would like to address for a moment, is that the, that the, the unity concept that we're projecting is too narrow. In one person's word, what we need is not unity of little socialist groups, but a broad, a broad front of resistance and change. Well, if we can't get these socialist groups together that exist today, who in the hell is going to build this broad movement for resistance and change? That, that runs counter to the whole experience of social movement in the United States, and certainly this particular experience of the left. As stated before, at no juncture in the history of this country have broad social movements emerged, cohered, and transformed without the involvement and stimulus of advanced forces. The proposal to unite an alliance, uh, uh, to, like, to unite in alliance, existing socialist groups, is not to lead small weak vessels into one larger weak vessel. Great, we're going to make it. <laughs> the fundamental purpose of such an alliance would be to garner the collective experience and organization of socialist groups to build a fully effective and ultimately victorious broad front of, re of resistance and change. There's no need to belabor the urgency of the moment. We can and must overcome antagonism, suspicion, rigidity, insularity, and reach out to each other to build vital, urgently needed left unity, without which the development and consolidation of a broad political progressive majority is not really possible. We need awakened political courage and generosity of spirit. We need resolute steps at all levels to form unity committees as soon as possible to forge concrete responses to austerity, to militarization, to war, to ecological crisis, and to launch the challenging process of building a socialist vision and consciousness. There is no greater task. I end with a brief quote from Malcolm X, who once said, we must come together and hear each other before we can agree. We must agree before we can unite, and we must unite before we can effectively face our oppressor. Thank you. Forge unity of the left, 
a new group, an alliance, a merger, some more successful than others. Rarely do these attempts on their own represent a major shift in the actual capacity of the left or the balance of political forces. I think that history shows that actual moments of heightened left unity or significant regroupments on the left or the emergence of new uh, decisive organizations usually appear due to a major shift in mass consciousness or due to the birth of new powerful uh, movements or as the result of decisive shift of the balance of forces in society as a whole. In other words, formal unity flows from actual unity of social forces, not the other way around. There are also several unique uh, political realities and challenges in the U.S. that uh, the left has to grapple with in, uh, in building left unity today. First, many people, and probably most, who are moving towards socialist ideas, like the ones mentioned in those polls, are not in left organizations, but they're being radicalized in social movements. And in many cases, not even in social movements, but outside of them, via the internet, self-study, higher education, etc. And many of these leftists are skeptical of political parties and organizations in general. While it's possible uh, that uniting several left organizations will inspire some, it is also likely that uh, it will go unnoticed by many more. An approach to left unity has to address this sector of people. Second, unlike in Europe and Latin America, where several left unity projects are in motion, we do not have a parliamentary system and have little opportunity for electoral alliance. Electoral alliance has been, in many countries, the framework for left unity. What does a non-electoral left alliance look like? How do we handle differences of approach to elections and the two-party system? We must learn from experiences of left unity around the globe, both current and historical, and, but I think it's clear in, that our left unity has to be built in a U.S. context based on our objective realities and peculiarities. <coughs> Third, the progressive and mass social movements, be they labor, peace, environment, student, etc., while often led by or influenced by the left, are not comprised primarily by left organizations. Uniting relatively small left groups in a country of millions will not have as big a political impact as building the strength of the working class and democratic movements as a whole and the unity of left action within those movements. There's also unprecedented openness to left ideas and even left organizations in many movements today. That's an opportunity uh, that shouldn't be squandered, but it also shouldn't be abused. So we must craft a left unity that includes and involves many of these mass movements without dictating to them from outside. I think that uh, you know these questions and, and others
not from uh, a position of weakness. Any new structure or instrument of left unity on a national level is likely uh, down the road. But that doesn't mean we should wait. Socialist groups can, take, uh, can work more closely together, moving from cooperation to coordination, or even collaboration. Uh, we can build comradely dialogue and open new forms of communication and exchange. We can create uh, social and political spaces to get to know each other. We can commit to uh, relate to each other's groups as equal partners with no monopoly on the, on the truth, with flexibility and respect. And we should keep talking, although I have to wrap up. I think these discussions in various venues with internal uh, in various venues should continue. Um, in conclusion, the size and influence of political health on the broad left and the balance of forces in the country will be determined in the course of building the broader social movements and struggles. We look forward to continuing the dialogue and look forward to continuing the work with others to build our community. organization, it's a little tricky to characterize our current thinking on this. 
but I'll share a few thoughts that I think have some degree of broad agreement among my comrades that others working to build left unity might find useful. First, uh, we erred in pushing for organizational unity while tending towards submit, submerging questions around our ideological and political differences. This is the error that our tradition calls all unity, no struggle. As a result, the majority of our left refoundation initiatives didn't end up meeting with a lot of success. Second, we put so much energy into unity building that to some extent we neglected our own organization. As a result, our own growth suffered. Over time, this actually weakened our efforts at building broader unity, as we had fewer forces to bring to the table than we otherwise might have. Third, leadership is essential, not just in the form of putting out ideas, but the actual practical work of leading. Freedom Road's most successful effort under Left Free Foundation, a multi-year initiative called Revolutionary Work in Our Times that involved many hundreds of people from multiple organizations, fell apart in the end mostly because Freedom Road lost internal unity around building it and slacked off on the work of leading it forward. Now to directly address Mark Solomon's proposals. Freedom Road strongly supports the common work of our respective organizations in the Left Labor Project and fully intends to continue that effort. Beyond that, we support those forces represented here that have a high level of ideological and programmatic affinity moving toward a higher level of organizational unity. We cannot, however, take part in ourselves in such a new initiative. Freedom Road's direction now as an organization is to focus first and foremost on building our own red mass work as an organization. We now see this as our single most important task. The left's weakness in the US is not solely or even primarily because of our disunity. It's also importantly because of the weakness of our connections to the broad masses of people, particularly to the working class and oppressed nationalities. Freedom Road believes that at this point, we as an organization can make the greatest contribution to a revitalized left by putting the bulk of our limited resources into our direct work among the masses. It seems also important to note that we see some fundamental issues that also hinder our involvement in the initiative uh, that Mark is proposing. One of these is around the basic ideological questions of just what socialism is and how it is won. Whether this will in the end be by reforming the existing system or by its forcible revolutionary overthrow. Freedom Road continues to hold to the latter, while it appears to us that most of the other groups here tend somewhat at least toward the former. Our own interaction with other left forces now consists mainly of bilateral relations with other revolutionary organizations we feel ideologically and politically closest to. Additionally, Freedom Road has long been known for our views on the centrality of what the left calls the national question. This means that we see the liberation of racially oppressed nationalities in, within the US as a central pillar of an overall revolutionary program. The point I made about the general weakness of the left's connection to the masses is particularly acute when it comes to the question of the left's base among communities of color. This is an essential point for comrades here to look at as they move forward. As I mentioned, Freedom Road certainly intends to continue our common work in the left labor project and whatever other particular initiatives arise in the future that we see as consonant with our organizational strategy. And we wish success to those comrades here who do decide to produce, uh, pursue greater organizational unity. Um, and on the final note, uh, as essential reading for anyone working on left unity, I'd like to recommend Freedom Road's pamphlet titled Which Way is Left, which lays out some of our most developed thinking that we put out under our Left Free Foundation work while we were carrying it out. That's available in the back uh, at the tables. Thanks a lot. Someone liking argumentation. So I was looking to respond to it critically. 
I was looking to uh, pick the final points of it, but I found myself in almost entire agreement with it. I think it asks the right questions and broadly comes to the right conclusions. And that's why I'm here. Um, even though I woke up a little sick uh, this morning. And, um, is this better? Yeah. Um, so I'm here, even though I woke up a little bit sick. And actually, especially because I woke up sick, because I figured, what better way to uh, show solidarity and left unity than to share my germs with all my... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, confident as I am, um, and I still want to uh, make my intervention uh, pretty concise rather than rehash most of Mark's presentation, which, like I said, I'm uh, very much in agreement with. Um, as a young socialist, um, and I, I consider myself somewhat of an independent socialist, but I am a, uh, a dues-paying member of DSA, but I'm a dues-paying member of DSA because a CCDS member uh, pays my dues for me. So I think that's, again, an embodiment of social CCD. Um, but my perspective here might be a bit warped, obviously, because uh, I know that calls like Mark's have been made throughout the years. And um, you know, my feeling, of course, is that this time around will be different. But I'm sure many of you might have had that feeling three or four times ago and might be done with you know, having that kind of feeling again the fifth time. Um, but you know, optimism of the will. Uh, but along with that, I think there's real shifts to, uh, to ground this optimism in some kind of reality. Uh, my initial experience with the socialist left, the first time that I, I saw the socialist left in action beyond just its literature, was um, uh, at an anti-war protest that I went to when I was um, a senior in high school. And I was struck with just how many groups there were on the far left, and how they were just competing, and they had tables next to each other, and they were denouncing each other, and it was just all very confusing. Um, but luckily, you know, I found it somewhat charming, um, and that's why I was okay with being a socialist. But I have a feeling that most people don't actually have that uh, response to it. Uh, I have a feeling that that multiplicity, um, that kind of internal chaos, is actually quite, um, you know, that fractiousness actually makes it quite difficult for young socialists to um, actually educate and politicize themselves. Now, luckily among my generation of socialists, I think we're quite a bit less sectarian than many of our elders. But, happy as I am about this, I think that to some degree it might be reflecting, worth reflecting on one of the negative reasons why we might be less sectarian than our elders. And I think that might just be because, to a certain degree, we might be less ideological than that, in a bad way. And then I think there's lower levels of politicization among people in my generation, in part because there's been a poor job done at socialist education and the transmission of institutional knowledge between the generations. So what I think one of the functions of a larger and more unified organization eventually, and in the meantime, joint work and joint education work, will be to educate and organize young radicals in a more efficient way than we're doing now. We want, in other words, ideological socialists, and especially ideological young socialists, who choose to be non-sectarian, rather than people who are simply non-sectarian because they don't have their own convictions, because they haven't been exposed to these debates. You know, we want an environment that fosters, in other words, contentious debate, while still fostering a productive atmosphere in which this common work and the common program can be achieved. So, yeah, in, in a sense, I think that we should consider as socialists how to create this kind of environment. And I think one of the ways we can create it is by, in addition to uh, unifying our, our activism around a, a joint program, consider the ways in which we have joint education, non-sectarian, intelligent education, and you know, groups like CCDS and CP and DSA can all have their membership, in a way, politicized in an environment that 
fosters debate, but productive debate, and the open exchange of discussions. I also think as socialists, you know, I, I, and I wasn't planning to mention this, but I will just because it hasn't come up yet, we should consider the great successes of Occupy, and even emerging as a movement and politicizing a great number of people, and not just in a kind of vague, uh, hand wavy sort of way, but more seriously. Uh, Occupy in its early stages was a result of a creative wellspring within the anarchist movement. You know, it kept it as, a, as a tactic. It was really, really, you know, a, a novel tactic, and it's a tactic that I would have thought would have failed miserably, and I didn't have high hopes for it. And I'm sure all of us, uh, maybe someone would want to say that they had high hopes for it, but I'm pretty sure it couldn't have came out of the existing American socialist movement as it is, an idea like that. Now, I think the thing to remember there is this kind of fierce urgency of now was on display with the early occupiers, and this core that formed the core of the Occupy movement. And in a sense, as, as leftists, instead of deriding that kind of thing as, as volunteerism, um, we should take some of that spirit and apply it to things like left unity in our joint work. Instead of putting it off to the medium term and the long term, we should think about this as an immediate end, an end that has urgency. In other words, volunteerism and this first urgency of now towards a political program that's about stable long-term organization building and stable long-term politicization and eventually forming some sort of, uh, of core of a future socialist opposition movement in this country. And in a sense, this should be an extremely easy task compared to the task that awaits us if we want to actually change society. We're talking about a few thousand people and a few organizations. And if you can't do this, then maybe we do have reasons for, for pe pessimism to be in life. <laughs> but on that cherry note, um, I'll just conclude that what I really liked about Mark's call compared to other such calls and uh, to some degree, the responses from the speakers, other speakers, was his urgency. And I think that's a spirit that we should really celebrate and um, a spirit that we should keep as we uh, move forward in these discussions. Thank you. 
thinks that we are the same as them. And I think it's very important that we think about how do we grow outside of our existing movement and recruit more people to socialism. So my concern with left unity is that and it leads us into a conversation about how we can reshuffle the tiny socialist movement and all our alphabet soup of organizations rather than really grappling with the, the question of how do we expand the socialist movement. Um, and obviously part of this comes because I think we all have different ideas about what socialism is. I mean, obviously to me it means economic democracy, but it also needs to be thoroughly democratic. Um, it needs to be pluralistic. Civil liberties must be central. Um, in the United States especially, uh, we can't, you know, we need to build a movement that is democratic. And I think that, like Bosworth was talking about, I think we have a lot to learn from Occupy Wall Street, um, both ideologically and tactically. Um, it needs to be rooted in American realities, um, and it needs to learn from American movements, um, including the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, not just socialist movements abroad. And we need to take power seriously and not just be satisfied with being a thoroughly marginalized movement. Um, so those are all things that I think have to be central, and we are asking people to invest tremendous time and energy to building a movement um, for a longer term and very, very difficult goal. So we have to keep that in mind. Organizing is already difficult, um, but we know that organization is power, and we know that organizing under neoliberal capitalism is particularly difficult because our social relationships are fractured. Uh, Facebook, people think that liking something on Facebook is a political action, or they, young people really don't think that government actually can have a positive impact in their lives or that it will be responsive to pressure from social movements. Um, and those are all realities that make it very difficult to organize, and I think it, it forces us to rethink how we organize our institutions on the left. But I agree with the other panelists that we have to succeed, we don't have a choice because we're really approaching ecological crisis. Um, we're approaching, I mean, the demographic shifts in this country are prompting um, very dangerous shifts in um, policies and um, consciousness of Americans. And the labor movement is, we all know how the labor movement is severely eroded, more than I think many of us thought would ever be possible. So our, our major task really is organizing within the social forces that can overcome capitalism, in my opinion, rather than, as I said, rearranging the deck chairs. And I see the most vibrancy right now in the immigrant rights movement and the movement of low-wage workers, not necessarily in traditional unions. And among young people, both in Occupy Wall Street as well as in anti-debt activism. And, um, this, we, we need to engage with these movements, not only because we can't overthrow capitalism without them, without a very broad movement, but because you just have to look around the room to see that the socialist movement is not um, diverse enough on terms of age, race, or gender. Uh, so we have to organize, we have to grow, and uh, we have to expand within the working class because we do not have any. Um, obviously, DSA's strategy for doing this is really to participate in social movements. There have been a lot of popular explosions around the country and around the world in the last few years. I do think that we're moving towards a more politicized consciousness, but we're not there yet. We need to build the organization and the institutions that will be ready to respond if and when something does catch fire. Um, but we also need to fight for victories, even though we haven't been winning very many victories. Um, but Bosker's call for political education call by others for political education, I think, has to be really central. Um, I agree with Bosker that my generation and generations younger than me um, need political education, but it needs to be done especially. Um, younger generations need to learn from the lessons of the left, but the left needs to learn from the lessons of Occupy and people. So on the question of socialist unity, DSA was born out of a merger of organizations, so I can say that it takes tremendous resources, and um, I, I think that we need to work together. It has to come from the bottom up. We have to be careful.
careful that we don't take resources away from expanding our movement just uh, to, to be internally focused. So I really think that if we're going to work together, we have to start at the grassroots and we cannot give up on organizing new people.